to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the apostle peter said baptism does now also save us and while we emphasize and have tried in these lessons to emphasize the importance of baptism today we want to present something maybe a little different there are some things baptism will not do in the bible and we want to talk to you about those today to help us understand its place and its importance but also our need to continue on in our walk with jesus and so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by Christians and members of the Church of Christ in your area. Those Christians would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, visit the local Church of Christ in your area, whether it be on Sunday or Wednesday for Bible study, you will find people there who are sincere in their desire to know God, who are friendly and warm and inviting, who would love to sit down and just open up the Bible and study the Word of God. And so check out the local Church of Christ in your area. You'll find wonderful people there who love others and who love God. And friend, that's exactly what we do here at the Gospel of Christ as well. We love you. God loves you. Our main emphasis is to help people know God and to go to heaven. And so we want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Check us out on Facebook as well from our Facebook page. Great way to keep up with what we're doing. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson series on baptism, just go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Fill out a media request form. If you need that on DVD, CD, we'll be glad to send that to you free of charge. Or if you could download that instantaneously, digitally on one of your devices, that would be great as well. All of our lessons, all our material, transcripts, study questions, all the material we have, it's available to you 24 seven free of charge from our website. And we hope you'll avail yourself of that great opportunity. And friend, don't forget to check out the Gospel of Christ app available in the respective Play Stores, Apple and Android Play Store. From that, you can uh, download that. It's a great way to keep up with new lessons, what we're doing, stay in contact with us and study the Word of God in our fast-paced world today. It might sound a little odd initially with what we've been talking about concerning the importance of baptism, what it does do, to say, well, let's consider for just a moment some things baptism will not do. But just by way of reminder, the Bible teaches that when one repents of his sin, in faith confesses Jesus as the Son of God, and that individual is baptized in water for the forgiveness of his sin, then baptism washes away. We contact the blood of Jesus. We are baptized into his death. We contact the blood of Jesus, which saves at the point of baptism. And scripture teaches that baptism forgive. We are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts 2.38, uh, Acts 22.16, Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13. The Bible teaches that through baptism, we are added to the Lord's church. Acts 2, verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily. Those who are being saved. By one spirit, we're all baptized into the one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. The scriptures teach that, that baptism, just by way of reminder, puts us in Christ. As many of you as were baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 27, Romans 6, verses 3 through 6. And of course, baptism is for salvation. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. And so there's no doubt baptism is essential. It's something God has asked us to do. It is indeed important for salvation. But friend, I want you also to realize there are some things that baptism cannot be replaced for 
and that it cannot do. L let me illustrate. For example, baptism cannot save a person who doesn't believe and won't repent. Now, hear me well. We want to stress today that baptism is not some mystical, magical talisman, as it were, that removes sin. It's not as though all you got to do is get in the water, just get in the water and your sins are removed. Baptism will not save a person who doesn't believe and won't repent. If that were the case, if baptism were just some magical potion, as it were, and all you had to do was get in the water, well, friend, wouldn't it make sense as part of the Great Commission, we would go and take people by force and put them in the baptistry just so they could be saved? That's not how it works. Because baptism cannot save somebody who won't believe and won't repent. John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm he, you will surely die of your sins. A person must believe Jesus is the Son of God before he can be baptized. Uh, the scripture, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16, baptism cannot save someone who believes, is willing to be baptized, but won't repent. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3, uh, Peter preached, repent first and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. A chapter later, he said, repent that see, and turn again that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so if a person won't believe and repent, about getting that person wet in water is not going to do anything to help that person be saved. Well, what else will baptism not do? Friend, baptism will not remove the physical consequences one may face due to sin. Let me illustrate. Let, let me use an example of how physical consequences may still be there after one is forgiven from an Old Testament figure. As you recall, David committed a great sin with Bathsheba in 1 Samuel 11 and 12. And yet David realized he was in sin. He repented of that sin. And according to Psalm 32, verse 5, 2 Samuel 12, verses 9 through 14, God forgave David of that sin. But just because he had been forgiven didn't mean there were some physical consequences to that sin. You see, David still faced the death of his son Absalom. There was the problem that happened between Amnon and Tamar. Uh, Absalom murders Amnon and flees. Uh, Absalom creates this great treason. He ultimately faces defeat and death, Absalom does, but there were still physical consequences that God told David were going to happen because of that sin. Think about the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, verse 16, Saul, obeys, he obeys God. Acts 22, 16, he's forgiven of his sins. And yet Paul still had physical, he still felt that guilt. Paul still realized what he'd done. And, and, and as a result, Paul was even persecuted by some because of his changing and obeying the gospel. When a person obeys the gospel, they're forgiven of past sin. But that doesn't mean there might not be physical consequences. Let's illustrate it this way. Let's say somebody has broken the law, is put in prison because they've done wrong. But in prison, they learn the gospel, they obey the gospel, they are baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. The moment they obey the gospel in prison, their sins are forgiven but they may still have to face physical. They don't get a, a get out of jail free card once they obey the gospel. The gate's not open to them now to walk out of the prison. There may be persecution. There may be problems. There may be family problems that come from that. And so we don't want people to get the wrong idea as though baptism is some magic talisman that all their problems are going to be eliminated. Baptism deals with the problem, the sin problem, and forgives that but there may still be physical consequences to that. Also, let's realize another thing baptism will not do. Baptism will not remove one's temptation to sin. People who were baptized still faced temptation in the Bible. 
Uh, Jesus was baptized in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and pretty shortly after that, Jesus was taken into the wilderness, and he was tempted by the devil greatly. Just because Jesus was baptized doesn't mean all temptation was eliminated. Think about Simon the sorcerer. He is baptized. He immediately falls back into temptation and sin because he now sees, unlike his tricks, he now sees a bona fide miracle, and he says, give me money, or I'll give you money that I may buy that. And Peter says, your heart's not right in the sight of God. You fall back into sin. You need to repent and pray. Just because Simon obeyed the gospel didn't mean the temptation to sin was removed. In fact, all Christians have to face the temptation to sin. Temptation comes from within. James 1 verses 13 and 14. And we all have to battle. In fact, in all reality, once we obey the gospel, our temptation may likely intensify. You remember when that one person cleaned out all the evil spirits, got them out of his life, and then they came back more severe, harsher as it were. They knew he had now been separated and was right with God, and there was a sense of intensity to that. And so, friend, we don't want someone to be under the guise that, or the delusion that if you obey the gospel, you become a Christian, you're baptized for the remission of your sins, all temptation is now going to be removed. No, temptation still exists, and the devil now may be working overtime. Since you have separated yourself from him and aligned with God, he wants you back, and he may be working overtime to do that. Let's consider another one. Let's also realize that the baptism, although it removes the guilt of sin, it will not remove the memory of sin. And by that we mean this. Yes, I've been forgiven of every wrong thing I've ever done, but God has not erased that memory in my mind. Paul said formerly, I was a blasphemer. I was injurious to the cause of Christ. Paul had not lived as he wanted to live, although he, done, he did it with a good conscience. Paul, although he obeyed the gospel, he still had the memory of that. Do you think Paul ever thought about holding those coats in Acts chapter 7 as Stephen was stoned? That memory was not erased. Yes, the sin was forgiven. But friend, realize this. That memory of past sin doesn't have to be a bad thing. Did you know that memory of past sin can help us not to repeat them? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, you've got the people of Israel, and they are reminded, the people of Christ, God's children in the New Testament, a, a specific example of how the Israelites fell away is brought up as a reminder to Christians, take heed lest ye fall. Yes, I've got to learn to forgive myself. I've got to learn to let go of the past. But you know, I can also learn from it. I can learn. I don't ever want to go back into a life like that again. There ought to be a sense of thankfulness that that memory is not erased because I remember how bad it was. I remember how hopeless it was. I remember how dire the situation was. I don't ever want to go back into that situation and that type of lifestyle again. Then consider this. What else will baptism not do? Friend, baptism, it is never taught, nor is it promised anywhere in the Bible, that baptism is somehow going to remove all the problems of life. I think somewhere along the way, if we're not careful in teaching people how good it is to be a Christian and understanding the help we receive and understanding that forgiveness of sins is going to occur, Sometimes, if we're not careful, people can get the idea that if I'm baptized, all the problems of life are going to cease to exist. My friend, that's just not true. The Bible teaches that baptism will not do that. In fact, the Bible teaches Christians will still face problems. Paul said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. In fact, in the Bible, it teaches us that some would even fall away because of trials and tribulations, Matthew 13, verse 20 and 21. Now, understand, God helps us. God will give us what we need to endure. We have a family to lean on. We have a past that really is behind us and in the past, and we have help 
but let's also realize being baptized does not mean tomorrow you wake up and your life's perfect from now on and you've never got a problem. There's still sickness. There's still problems that may occur in the family. There's still problems that may occur in the work life. There's still issues you have to deal with. But here's the big deal. Now I don't have to deal with it alone. Now I can truly say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, I've still got problems, but now I've got the one in my life who can address and help with and give me the strength to face those problems and to endure them in this life. Well, what else will baptism not do? Baptism won't make spiritual growth unnecessary. Meaning this, when you're baptized, you don't stop there. Being baptized doesn't mean now that everything's perfect spiritually and you don't need to grow and you don't need to continue as a Christian. The Bible teaches quite the opposite of that. The Bible says Christians must and to their faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, godliness, godliness. And it goes on to mention all those things in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 10. I've got to now bear fruit to God. John chapter 15, 1 through 10, Matthew 13, verses 20 through 23. And friend, the Christian is taught. He now, as a newborn babe, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3, needs to do everything within his power to grow as a child of God, as a newborn babe, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. First Peter 2 verse 2, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so baptism is not going to make spiritual growth unnecessary. If anything, it puts us in Christ as a little newborn babe. And now I've got to desire I've got to strive. I've got to try every day to grow and mature and to fight off Satan and to really be what God wants me to be in this life. Friend, also realize this. Baptism is not going to dissolve past marriage problems. Baptism, nowhere in the Bible does it teach baptism washes away relationships. That's, that's, not, that's not something the Bible teaches. In fact, Herod and Herodias, we see from the example there, Mark 6, 17 and 18, that it was not lawful for Herod to have his brother's wife. That was contrary to the law of God. Realize as it relates to this, that, that marriage is something that is from the beginning, and it's for whoever enters into it. Matthew 19, verses 3 through 9, in the beginning. God made them male and female. God said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so marriage is not just a Christian relationship. It's for anybody and anyone who enters that from the beginning of time. We have to follow God's laws in doing that. And we say that for this reason. Oftentimes, maybe, Two people might have been married before obeying the gospel, and for whatever reason, they did not divorce scripturally, and now they've remarried, and somehow, somewhere along the way, people got the idea that once I obey the gospel, because past sins are forgiven, that somehow that marriage bond, that, that unscriptural marriage, is now somehow going to be washed away as well. Let's illustrate it this way. If one robs a bank, let's say you rob a bank, and, and sometime after that, you realize you need to obey the gospel. Maybe somebody comes and brings the gospel to that person. Uh, they realize, I need to become a Christian. Oh, friend, when you obey the gospel, that doesn't mean now that you get to keep all that money you stole. That doesn't mean you get to keep staying in that situation. Here's the idea. Repentance occurs before baptism. If someone is in an unscriptural marital state, that person is not a candidate to be baptized until they repent. Repentance means I can't keep living in adultery. Adultery is something you can live in. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. To stop doing that, I've got to repent of that, which means I can no longer continue in that sinful state. And so nowhere in the Bible does it teach that marriage is going to, or baptism is somehow going to dissolve 
a marriage bond or an un, make an unscriptural divorce right or give somebody another. That's, that's not taught anywhere in the Bible. Unbelievers and believers married in the Bible, and there were specific laws that God gave for that. Jesus said this, unless a man divorces his wife, for fornication and marries another, he commits adultery. Divorce for fornication uh, is the only scriptural reason in the Bible. And, and then and only then does the innocent party have the right to remarry in that situation. Friend, we realize then that baptism will not remove the physical consequences of sin. It's not going to take away my temptation to sin. My memory of sin is not going to be erased. It doesn't make spiritual growth unnecessary, and it's not going to make bad situations somehow right. Now, please hear me as well that baptism is not a guarantee of eternal salvation. Here's what we mean by that. Salvation is spoken of in two senses in the Bible. We are saved from past sin. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. There is the eternal salvation that we all have in Jesus Christ. And yet there are a host of passages that warn the Christian that you can lose that salvation. Acts chapter 8, clear example. Think about this. Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 23, Simon is baptized for the remission of his sins. He obeys the gospel. He becomes a Christian. Almost immediately, he falls back into sin. He sees Peter or Philip work a bona fide miracle and he offers him money to buy that gift. And he says, you've got no part or portion in this matter. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, and pray that the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. The man of God there told him he was not right. He needed to repent that he had fallen from God's grace and that he was in a lost state. And so just being baptized doesn't guarantee eternal salvation. Baptism won't do that. It puts me in Christ. It washes away past sins. It's something I've got to do to obey God. But friend, it puts me in the kingdom. I've got to continue to walk in the light. 1 John 1 verse 7. I've got to continue to fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. I've got to strive every day to do what God wants me to do, to be right in his sight and never ever give up in obeying Jesus Christ. And so friend, along with this line, I we wanna emphasize again, baptism, essential, something you've gotta do, but it's not gonna be a solvent to all your problems. Uh, you hear a lot of people say, especially a lot of religious people will say, you do these things, you send us your money, you do all this and all your problems are gonna go away. My friend, that's not what the Bible says. That's a health and wealth, lure you in and hook, line, and sinker, draw everything from you type of ideology that's not found in the Bible. It's not as though financial wealth is promised or all your problems are going to go away or, or Christians never face any struggles. None of that's true. Here's what we do have. God promises me a home in heaven. Regardless of what I have or don't have in this life, I can learn to be content because I've got a home in heaven with God. God promises me that along the way as I face struggles, I don't have to face it alone. The Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do with me? And God promised me the strength to keep living and keep doing what he wants me to do each and every day. And so my friend, we ask you today, have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Have you submitted your life to the almighty God in obedience to his will and done what he teaches, teaches to be saved? You say, well, what exactly is that? I heard you mention some things about baptism today, but what exactly does the Bible teach I've got to do to be saved? Here's what they did in the New Testament to be saved. People first had to believe in Jesus. Unless you believe that I'm he, Jesus said, You'll die in your sins. John 8, 24, I got to believe Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He is the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. Then I must be willing to repent or turn from a life of sin. Peter preached, repent and turn again. 
that your sins may be blotted out. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. I've got to realize sin is wrong. I've got to make up my mind to the best of my ability. I'm going to try to do that every day. And then I've got to turn away from that. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. We all make mistakes from time to time, but I've got to make that commitment that I'm going to turn from a life of sin. I must confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Paul said, with the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Our Lord said, if you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before the Father who is in heaven, or before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And having believed in Jesus, repented of sin, confessed him as Lord and Savior, the Bible teaches to be saved. And to have your sins washed away, you must be immersed in water. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, was told by God's servant Ananias, get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And then once we've obeyed the gospel, Romans 6, verses 1 through 4 teaches, we die to sin, we're buried with him in baptism, and we rise up out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life. I live new. I live different. I've got a different way about me now because I'm a child of God and I'm no longer living for the same mundane, shallow, worldly purposes I'm living to glorify and honor God every day. And so, my friend, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that. If you'd like to study more, contact us. We'd be happy to discuss it with you. And we hope and pray that you will join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for the Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of